All to Jesus I surrender, I surrender all. wonderful way to begin our service, to bring everything that we are and have to the Lord Jesus and surrender all of our concerns, all of our issues, all of our heartaches, all of our will to the Lord Jesus. Let's uh, affirm that in Scripture as we read together now from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Let's begin. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to god and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus finally brothers whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is just whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank you so much for being here and attending worship with us today. Would you please start the attendance process by taking the pads from the outside, tear off a sheet, and pass it through? If you are a visitor, a first-time guest, we would very much like to welcome you personally, and we have a little gift for you. All you need to do is go to the welcome desk, which is just outside these double doors in the lobby, and you can do that right after the service. We would like to welcome you personally. Also out there at the uh, opposite desk, the camp registration desk, there are registrations available for Warm Lake Camp um, for the, the kids to attend camp this summer. And registration is open online. So please feel free to go home and get on your computer and get your kids registered to go to camp. Uh, baby bottles are also out there at that registration desk. We would love for you to pick one up and start collecting your cash, your change, uh, your pocket coins. You can write a check and throw in there and bring that bottle back, whether only partially full or completely full, bring the bottle back on Father's Day to help support Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center in their Change for Life fundraiser. The Truth Seekers Sunday School class is going to meet today in the Awana game room. Therefore, the class uh, headed by Johnny Lopez studying God as he longs for you to see him will be meeting in the Sunday school room just off of the fellowship hall, the room with the French doors will be there today. Uh, Sunday night Bible study at the Scots tonight, 6.30 p.m. Everyone is invited. If you don't know where that is, it is in the bulletin, so you can check there for the address. The Connections Sunday School class will be beginning today in the Fellowship Hall. This is a brand new class for young marrieds and for adults with young children. Nick and Maria Ernest are going to be hosting a gathering for that class Friday the 20th, so two, almost two weeks hence, at 6.30 p.m., and noshes will be provided. So you don't need to bring anything but yourselves and whatever else. Bring your Bible. Okay, uh, Monday morning, ladies' Bible study will resume in June. In June. Okay. It doesn't have a date. June what? Who knows? Mondays? Mondays. Okay, at 10 a.m. And all ladies are invited, so please be aware. There will be a newcomer's fellowship at the Shaw's on Thursday night at 7. So if you began attending FBC in the last few months... You are invited to attend this dessert fellowship, and you can RSVP for that by writing on your registration. Just write newcomers at the top of your registration. The deaconesses are offering something wonderful on June 4th. They are offering a mom's day out. 
So if you're a mom who just needs to have a break, child care will be provided, and all you need to do is go to the Welcome Center just outside the double doors, pick up a registration form, and make connections with them. Your opportunity for a nice day of relaxation. Well, a morning at least. If you are a mom and did not pick up a Mother's Day gift because maybe you weren't here last week or got busy and forgot, or if your mother lives nearby, please stop by the library. There are a few unclaimed gifts left, and we would love to put one in your hands. If you are looking for a place to serve at the church, we are recruiting helpers for the Sunday morning coffee and hospitality ministry. So if you are interested in um, getting the coffee prepared and the donuts put out or interested in greeting people as they arrive, um, not this is separate from greeting people at the door to hand out bulletins, but just greeting people in the library, welcoming them, and maybe getting to know people a little bit. If any facet of that ministry is interesting to you, um, please write coffee on your registration and someone will contact you. We still need host homes for one night, June 11th, for two women and two men from California Baptist University. There are more details about that in the bulletin. Now, as you probably know if you've attended here for very long, the only time you will see me come to church in jeans is if it's Rodeo Sunday or if I'm going to talk about family camp. So I warned you last week you were in for it. I was going to talk about family camp today. If you've been to family camp before, would you raise your hands? Awesome. Now, if you think that having an opportunity to get together with family, with friends, with other believers, a chance to cement relationships, to just relax and let down and have a good time. If that sounds like it would be a good idea for any believer, would you raise your hands? Come on, not more hands than that? Come on, you have to keep those up. Okay, everybody whose hands are up, you have just been deputized. <laughs> I need for you to go out and talk to people about the wonders of family camp and get registered to come. It'll be the first weekend in August. We're going to have a wonderful time. It's going to be a very short camp. It's only from midday on Friday through Sunday morning service. So won't be a long camp, but I tell you, we will pack a lot in there, and you will leave feeling rested and relaxed and connected and a little closer to God, I'm sure. So I hope you will seriously give that some consideration and share that idea with other people who might be interested in camp. Registration is available online, or they can talk to Stan or to me. We'd love to see you there. Thanks very much. Our missionaries of the week this morning are Blazing Hope Youth and Family Ranch. And uh, here's a stamped addressed envelope. You can send Mike Howard a note of encouragement. Just let him know, thank you, Mike. We're praying for you at First Baptist, and we appreciate all that you're doing. Here's a hand right here. And our other uh, missions reminder this, this week is Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center. We've already been reminded of the opportunity to share in the fundraising effort for Lifeline by picking up a baby bottle and filling it with change. But here's a chance to personally thank the ladies at Lifeline for all they do uh, to protect and preserve and uh, proclaim the sanctity of human life. It's a stamped envelope, dressed, ready to go. Um, here's a hand back here. Thank you very much. I have a flower right in front of me here. This beautiful uh, pink carnation is to announce the arrival of Avery Abigail Tobin. And uh, we have a little picture of Avery that you're going to see in just a moment. She's the daughter of Luke and Jessica Tobin. She was born May 6th at 5.44 in the morning, and uh, her mother was very thankful to see her, and so was her dad. And uh, Luke and Jessica are brand new parents. They're having a wonderful experience, and so thankful for the safe arrival of Avery. We have a ministry in Caldwell that has begun at Canyon Springs High School and has a great impact in our community that's beginning to develop and mature. 
and it's under the banner of Youth for Christ, and we have the privilege this morning of having Kelly Culver here. Kelly, come on up. Uh, I have invited Kelly to come and just introduce to you the ministry that he has and give you a better opportunity to understand and even participate in some way. So, Kelly, welcome. Good to have you this morning. Well, thank you, for Pastor Shaw, for letting me come and share. Um, as Pastor Shaw said, we are ministering at Canyon Springs High School. Um, if you don't know much about Canyon Springs, there's roughly 350 students there. 10% of those are homeless. So my wife and I moved here officially January 4th of this year from Western Washington, where I was on staff in Tacoma with Youth for Christ, working with inner city kids, doing outdoor ministry, so taking them rock climbing, backpacking. But God made it really clear this was where we were supposed to move and start over. Um, fresh with Youth for Christ. So the City Life program is kind of an inner city ministry to reach at-risk kids. So as I started traveling back and forth from Washington in August of last year, um, I started to meet people who were like, you need to go to Canyon Springs, find out about it, find out about it. So the thing that we've been doing, Pastor Shaw was talking about, is floats on Thursdays. So every Thursday after school for the last Almost two months now, we have been serving root beer floats to all the students who are required to stay for tutoring. So that's been an average of 50 students we're getting to meet and, and know. But not only that, the school has given me an open door to be there just like a staff person. Anytime I want to be there, I can walk through the door, go see kids that I've met, sit down with them in class, and just see how they're doing. So. What does that mean for you guys? Um, I'm a missionary, <laughs> full-time support. You guys can help in a ton of ways. Um, help with floats. Our last one for the school year, though, is this Thursday. Um, but you can help with floats. Our eventual goal is to open an after-school program. We want to we wanna have a center where we can bring kids in to where they can hear the gospel every day, um, where they can have loving relationships of adults like you wrapped around them. So we're looking for volunteers as we move forward. Um, financial support. Pastor Shaw and I have sat down a few times and he shared with me his experience with Youth for Christ back in when he was in high school. <laughs> so I know for a fact that Youth for Christ was really strong up until about 1972 in the Treasure Valley. So to be back in an area that was really rich with history of YFC is really exciting for me. So I'll be in the back. I'll have some information. Um, feel free to come talk to me after church. Thanks. Well, it's a good chance now for us to stand up and say hello to one another. Let's do that now, please. Good morning. It's my privilege to welcome everyone who's listening on KBGN this morning to our service and also those who are joining us on our internet ministry. Thank you for being a part of our service today from Caldwell First Baptist Church. It's a joy for us to be able to share our service with you and for you to be a part of our worship time together here. This morning, I'm continuing our series of messages in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. And also this morning, we're beginning something new, a, a children's sermon. We'll invite the children up front in just a few minutes, and I'll try to relate the essence of one of the portions of our text this morning directly to children. Thank you for being a part of our service today. It's a joy to have you worship with us. Please, please find your place. Please find your place. Return to your place. And we're going to begin our worship this morning. 
by singing together hymn number 104, King of Heaven, Lord Most High. to our next hymn. <laughs> Shifting shadows of 
Please remain standing as we read together our verse of the month this month, which is 1 Corinthians 1.18. We'll say the reference, and then the verse, and then the reference at the end. Let's begin. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we're going to uh, begin a new tradition this morning, and that is that I'm going to invite the children to come forward, and we're going to uh, have a little, chairman, uh, a little children's story this morning because uh, the children will not be dismissed for, for kids' church. So uh, kids, come on down, would you please? You can sit right here on the steps. Come right over here. Zeke, I'm sorry that you're not excited about this. <laughs> All right, find your spot up here. Okay, I'm going to stand off to the side because really, you know what this is really all about is all the adults getting a chance to see you. Um, but I'm also going to tell you a story. And, and here's the story. Did you know that Jesus talked about you? Yeah, Kenna knows. Jesus talked about you. Here's what he said. Some adults came to Jesus and said, we want to be really great in, in your kingdom. How do we do that? Who's the, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus said, Jesus said, just a second, and he brought a small child, probably a child as young as one of you. He brought a small child, and he pushed, put this child right in the middle of these adults. And he said, here's how, here's how you become great. You become just like this little kid, just like this little child. If you really want to be great, in my kingdom, yet to come just like a child. Now, what did he mean by that? Did he mean that you have to become a little tiny person? No, no. What, who do you depend on for your breakfast? Your parents. Who do you depend on to have a place to sleep? Your parents. Your, your dad and your mom, right? And who do you depend on to make sure you have something to wear? Your mom and dad. So you are completely depending on your parents for everything you need. That's what Jesus meant. That's when he said, in order to be great, you need to become just like a little kid. So Jesus was talking about you. And he wants adults to be like you when it comes to trusting and depending on him. Thank you very much for coming this morning. I'll be talking more about this story in the sermon. Maybe you can learn some more about it. Now you can go be seated with your parents. The ushers are coming to receive our offering at this time. and. Uh, this is the last Sunday that Carol Brenton will be with us. Uh, she's leaving tomorrow to return to Nairobi, Kenya, and launching a new phase of her ministry there with the deaf, and specifically with deaf women, training them and also instructing them in God's Word. And I've asked Carol to just come on up so that we can uh, pray for her as, uh, as we send her out on behalf of ministry here at First Baptist and as an extension of our ministry here to extend that back to Nairobi. And would you pray with me, please, as we pray together? Father, we thank you for the burden that you placed on Carol's heart, for the preparation and training that you provided for her, for the opportunity that awaits her in Nairobi, and for the blessing that we know she will be to the women there who are so excited about her return. I pray that her effectiveness will not just be in, 
economic and language development, but also will extend to the spiritual revitalization, the spiritual transformation of the women that, whose lives that she will touch. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be a part, a small part of the ministry that she has in going forward. We pray for her safety and for her well-being as she travels and begins this new work and establishes her life back in Nairobi. Also, Father, we thank you for Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center and for the ministry of Blazing Hope Youth and Family Ranch. We pray that those ministries will continue to grow, touch the lives of many people. We also rejoice in other churches that are holding forth the word of life in our community. We, play for, we pray for uh, Calvary Chapel Caldwell and for Calvary Baptist in Burley. We pray for churches and pastors alike that they will be encouraged in the forward work of proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Thank you for the privilege we have of extending our worship as we give. We also pray for the ministry of Youth for Christ in Caldwell and pray that it will continue to grow, touching students at Canyon Springs and other students in Caldwell. And we give you praise and thanks for all of your goodness to us in so many ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jared. Well, uh, as uh, Warna mentioned earlier, we're uh, shifting the adult classes that meet in the basement, or several of them around today. Um, the True Seekers class will be meeting in the Iwana game room, which is right under the platform here. And um, John Lopez's class is meeting in that room off the fellowship hall with the double doors. And then our new connections class will be meeting in the fellowship hall in front of the kitchen and we're excited about each one of these class opportunities. I don't know if you heard about the uh, feud that happened between the pastor and the choir director of the Hickville Baptist Church. It seems the first hint of trouble came when the preacher preached on dedicating yourselves to service, and the choir director chose to sing, I shall not be moved trying to believe it was just a coincidence the pastor put the incident behind him the next Sunday he preached on giving and afterwards the choir squirmed as the director led them in the hymn Jesus paid it all 
By this time, the pastor was losing his temper. Sunday morning attendance was beginning to swell as people wanted to see what was going to come of this tension between the two. A large crowd showed up the next week to hear his sermon on the sin of gossiping. Would you believe the choir director selected, I love to tell the story. (laughs) There was no turning back then. The following Sunday, the pastor told the congregation that unless something changed, he was considering resignation. The entire church gasped when the choir director led them in the old hymn, Why Not Tonight? (laughs) Truthfully, no one was really surprised when the pastor resigned a week later, explaining that Jesus had led him there and Jesus was leading him away. And the choir director couldn't resist, picked the final hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I have a little saying, you know, it is that truth is always stranger than fiction. But in this case, I think fiction wins the day. (laughs) We're in Matthew chapter 18 this morning. This is the fourth discourse of Jesus with his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. And this one is focused more personally, intentionally, on the disciples themselves. This chapter forms essentially a sermon in itself describing the childlike nature of believers. And my my little story illustrates how childlike uh, sometimes adult believers can be with all the weaknesses that that description implies. We enter the kingdom as children. We need to be protected and cared for in the family of God as children. We need to be disciplined like children. And we're going to look at all those aspects of life in the Christian community this morning. Uh, And then next week, uh, in a second part of this sermon that Jesus taught here in Matthew chapter 18, we need to be forgiven and forgive one another like children. Focus of this story is happening in Capernaum, but Jesus has essentially finished his public ministry in Galilee, and he's focusing intently and purposefully and personally on training his disciples. And the text opens, as I mentioned to the children just a few minutes ago, the text opens with the secret of greatness. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. At that time, which would be just after Jesus had talked with Peter about paying the temple tax. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This isn't the first time or only time the disciples raised this issue. It was an issue that they circled back to from time to time. In another occasion, Jesus said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. And here the question comes up again, Who's the greatest? And calling to him a child and putting him in the midst of them, he said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn, interesting word, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he answers the question more specifically, Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the disciples are interested in greatness, and Jesus does not rebuke them for being interested in greatness. I don't think uh, any of us would be honest in saying um, that we were not interested in being great. We want our lives to count for something. We want our lives to be purposeful. We want, when we're all finished, someone to say, that was good, that was a good job. You you lived well, you did right. I'm so proud of you. You know, you're a pretty great person. I mean, there's a natural desire in all of our hearts not to be a person who finishes last in terms of God's approval. We We want to be approved by the Lord. And Jesus put his finger on the point of beginning as a foundation for where greatness starts. He did not rebuke the disciples for their curiosity about greatness. 
Instead, he gave them a key fundamental basic foundation of where greatness begins. The disciples asked the question, who's the greatest? How do we achieve greatness? And Jesus uses the presence of a child to illustrate his answer. The text would indicate that this was probably a very young child. When, when we're born, we're born outside of God's kingdom. We're born into our own selfishness and sinful nature. And in order for us to become part of God's kingdom, we have to make a transition from the kingdom of this earth to the kingdom of God, from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus makes it clear that in order for that to happen, greatness requires a change of heart. This word turn, that's translated in the ESV that I'm reading from, is an interesting word. It involves at least three aspects of transition. The first is to repent. And you're familiar with this word. It means I was going this way, and to repent means I'm going to turn and go this way. It's a complete change of direction of life. So in order to be great, I begin with the process of repenting from the way I have been living my life and living my life in a completely different focus. To turn also means to acknowledge or to admit my spiritual bankruptcy. There is also within the human spirit a desire to feel good about myself, to think that if I try harder and work more efficiently and effectively, I can be approved by God. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can make New Year's resolutions. I can turn over a new leaf. I can become a better person. I can please God in the way I live my life. And Jesus said, no, you have to turn away from that kind of thinking and acknowledge that within yourself there dwells no good thing. And the other aspect of turning or having a change of heart is to embrace meekness. Meekness, that is, God is God and I am not, and therefore I humble myself before him. In fact, to make it even more plain, entering the kingdom requires a childlike response to God. And that's what Jesus was saying. That's what I was explaining to the children a few minutes ago that the point of bringing the child into the midst of them is to say that a child acknowledges their dependence. And Jesus is saying in, to his disciples and to us that in order to be great in, in my kingdom, it involves a dependence upon me, a complete dependence on Christ. It's the nature of a child to be dependent, to count on parents, a small child, particularly a newborn child, is completely helpless, completely dependent upon others, and that process continues across the years until at the end of school and as a, as a person begins to launch into their adult life, that dependence on their parents begins to diminish and finally fade away. But there's a relationship there that continues for a lifetime, the parental relationship. But a young child is simple and dependent and helpless and trusting of others. Of course, every child has a sin nature. Every child within themselves needs that transformation. Jesus is talking about this aspect of childhood that relates to dependence. And then he goes on to spell it out specifically, no more Mr. Big Shot. Humility is the greatest kingdom attribute. James says in James 4.10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. The only place of going up is to go down. To achieve greatness, become small. To be great in God's kingdom, be a servant of everyone. That's what the scripture teaches us. In this sermon that Jesus is teaching his disciples, there are many aspects of life in the Christian community and the issue began with this question raised by the disciples. And then Jesus continues to press 
various issues that are related to this opening issue of greatness. The second thing he talks about is the seriousness of sinful influence. Now, as we move into this section, I want you to think not of small children, but I want you to think of young believers because Jesus is not talking specifically about little children. He's talking about believers as children. Look at verse 5. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. These young believers who are childlike. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for its temptations to sin, for it's necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Having established the illustration, Jesus continues to use it, referring to believers as children, believers of all ages. And his point is that accepting other believers in their immaturities acknowledges Christ's life in them. Instead of complaining about others, instead of being an irritant to others, instead of judging others, Jesus said, receive them and accept them and encourage one another in their walk with Christ. In fact, Jesus uses this extremely vivid language and simply says that a person is better off dead who influences another person who is young in faith to sin. That's quite a statement. It's better off that person would just die than to influence someone to sin. This uh, picture of a millstone is vivid. A millstone was the, the large upper stone turned in the grinding process by a donkey as stones rubbed one against another in the grinding of grain. So these stones weighed hundreds of pounds. And Jesus is saying, in pretty vivid language here, it's better that a person would have that stone roped around their neck and tossed into the sea than that they should lead someone to sin. Romans sometimes executed by tying large stones around the neck of the offender and tossing them in deep water. William Barclay told the story of a man on his deathbed who was terribly distraught. He said, when I was a boy, my friends and I reversed a sign at a crossroads. I've worried all my life about how many people I sent the wrong direction by doing that. Would that we would have concern about any signals to sin that we've sent out to other people, any way in which we have influenced someone else to violate God's law and principles. There's many ways we can do that. It's possible to put a direct temptation in front of someone. When Eve offered to Adam the forbidden fruit, she placed a direct temptation in front of Adam. She'd been deceived, but Adam knew exactly the consequences of that behavior. And here was his loved one, his wife, placing this temptation in front of him. There's also the temptation of emotional manipulation, trying to get someone to do something by emotionally manipulating them and tempting them in that way. It's also possible to cause someone to sin by setting a sinful example. All of us are being watched in our lives by someone. And we all have the opportunity to direct someone towards godliness or direct someone towards sin by the way we live, by the decisions that we make. And another way that we can tempt someone else who's weaker in their faith is to flaunt the freedoms that we have. I touched on that briefly last week. The danger of exercising a freedom that a younger, less mature believer with a more tender conscience does not have in some gray area of life. Jesus said, watch it, be careful. Better that you should die than to do that. Be very careful. And then he goes on to call down calamity and judgment on the heads of all who put temptations in front of other people. This is serious business, Jesus said. 
This all comes in the context of what it means to be great. How can you destroy greatness? By being careless and causing others to sin. We need to take it with deadly seriousness. That's what Jesus is saying. Then he presses the point even more forcefully and talks about the sober reality of self-responsibility and self-control. And he used this, this hyperbolic figurative language. Look at the text here, verse 8. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, obviously, Jesus is using figurative language here. Though across the centuries, some people have taken these things literally and have uh, mutilated themselves in an effort not to sin. But the problem with that is, of course, we know that sin starts in the heart. Sin starts in the mind and the heart and the will. And it's exercised by our limbs and our eyes and our bodies. But Jesus is warning us not to mutilate ourselves, but to do whatever is necessary to keep ourselves from sin. Obviously, only non-believers are in danger of hell, but believers are reminded of the seriousness of sin and the danger of leading others into sin. So let me just state it this way, and I think this captures the essence of what Jesus is saying. First, he said, take the strongest possible measures to stop yourself from taking up or going to places of temptation. I always think of the story of the man who was walking down the street, not paying attention to what he was doing, fell in a hole, and he spent the rest of the day trying to get out of that hole that he'd fallen into, and finally managed to somehow get out. And the next day, as he was going to his place of work, he wasn't paying attention. He, he uh, knew the hole was there, but he just didn't, wasn't paying enough attention to it, and he fell in there again. Same thing. The third day, he thought, you know, I've got to be careful of that. I better take a close look at it. Before he knew it, he'd fallen in again. Finally, on the fourth day, he went a different way. He went a different way. That's what Jesus is saying. Take drastic measures with where you go or what you put your hands to. If you know that, that whatever that is is going to be a temptation to you, don't pick it up, for heaven's sake. If you know that walking down that way past those places or those people is going to lead you into temptation, don't go there. If you know that person will be a stumbling block to you, don't make an appointment to meet them. And take the greatest possible precaution not to do it. Then Jesus said, take the strongest possible measures to keep yourself from looking at things that tempt you to sin. Every man understands that. Because the eyes are the gate to the mind. And what I see is emblazoned into my mind. Let me just be very specific. When I was a boy of about eight or nine years of age, I went into the shop of a man who had some pictures hanging on the wall of his shop. And those pictures are in my mind. I could describe them, a couple of them to you, in some detail. Why? Because they went into the eye gate of my mind and they were plastered there. Now, I don't, I don't look at them in my mind. I don't focus on them. But the eye is the gate to the soul. And if you're looking at some, Jesus said, if this business that you're looking at is tempting you to sin, stop it. Do everything possible to get that out of your life. Don't let that be a temptation to you. You know better. You know how dangerous that is. Don't look at it. If you can't handle those things, don't let them be in front of your face. 
or your heart or your mind. And take all necessary measures not to look, not to be able to look. Protect yourself from the temptation. Don't go there. Don't touch that. Don't look at that. Now, this is strong language. Jesus used very strong language because he doesn't want us to misunderstand how important this is. Why is that? Well, it's important for my own sake, but it's also important because if I'm dabbling in sin myself, it's virtually inevitable that I'm going to be dragging someone along with me, whether I intend to or not. Greatness in the kingdom involves paying attention to these things. Then Jesus takes this another step further and talks about the sacred duty of caring for others. Verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Again, thinking of young believers, immature believers, people who are coming along in their faith. Maybe it is a smaller child who you, have you've seen put their faith in Christ. And, and now there's a responsibility that we bear towards those children. For I tell you, and here's a curious verse that we misunderstand. We'll talk about this. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And then an illustration, one that's familiar to us. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it's not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. What's Jesus saying? By the way, your text may include verse 11. Verse 11 is not in the oldest manuscripts we have. It's essentially a quotation of Luke 19.10. So it is part of the scripture, but probably represented a scribal insertion at this point uh, in some past centuries. So your Bible includes it, but Matthew probably didn't pen it. <clears throat> we don't know for sure, but just mention that. That's why newer translations don't include verse 11. But it is in the text. It's in Luke 19.10. Jesus is saying that we need to see the eternal value of every other believer through God's eyes. If we look with God's eyes, we can see the significance of that person and value them and encourage them. We despise others when we flaunt our liberties, when we show partiality, when we withhold help from others who are struggling when we ridicule someone's appearance or we're indifferent to those who are stumbling into sin, or maybe we're resentful of those who are confronting our sinfulness instead of being humble with them, or taking advantage of someone for personal gain. There's all kinds of ways in which we can stumble and be an offense to other people. And Jesus says this curious thing. God has angels in his presence who minister to believers. Now, there's nothing technically in the Bible that talks about the concept of every child having a guardian angel. That's uh, fanciful and romantic, but I don't think we can defend the idea that every Christian has an, a specific angel assigned to them. There's a lot of fanciful thinking about it. You know, I, I am excited about the ministry of angels and there have been times when I, in my life when I felt like perhaps an angel has helped me. But I'm a lot more excited about Jesus than I am about angels. A lot more excited about Jesus. Angels are not going to save my life. Jesus saved me. Angels did not die for me. Jesus died for me. But it is nice to know that in the invisible realms, there are those spirits and agents of heaven who love Jesus and therefore love me and care about me. That, that's encouraging to me. And it's encouraging to me that there are angels who serve God faithfully and honor him and rejoice over him and proclaim his praises day after day after day after day, faithfully acknowledging the mightiness and authority of God and the person of Christ. I, I'm, I rejoice in that. 
And I rejoice that angels watch about how we honor Christ. And imagine how stunned the angels are in seeing us for whom Jesus died. And they see us being unfaithful to our Savior. That must shock them. And they do observe that. We are to bear witness of the influence of God's work in our lives in our salvation by bearing witness even to the angels who watch our lives. God calls his children to care for one another just as a faithful shepherd cares for a sheep because God has great love and concern for his own. His love is patient and personal and he's aware. For several days, and I remember this so vividly, for several days in the fall of 1987, the world focused its attention and compassion on a little girl, not quite two years old, who was trapped in an abandoned well shaft in West Texas. She was down in that well for three days. After hard work and difficult drilling and excavation, she was finally freed. There was almost an audible gasp of thankfulness and rejoicing all across the land. And I still remember in my mind seeing the pictures of this little girl whose life had been saved by those who went to all that trouble. She was sent thousands of cards and gifts as people rejoiced over her saving as she recuperated. She wasn't more precious or worthy of, than any other child, but her need was so great it touched the compassion of people all over the country. And even the angels, the scripture tells us, rejoice when a lost one is saved, when a lost one comes back home, when a sheep who has wandered away from God's care comes back into fellowship with Jesus. And if we have the heart of Christ and we see one of our fellow believers struggling, Jesus is calling us to, as a shepherd, seek after that person. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility as believers, as followers of Christ. It's, we all share this together. The point is that God takes the initiative to come after us. He goes to great lengths to draw us back to himself. He's gone to eternity itself to save us and redeem us. And rescue results in great celebration. It's essentially, as Jesus told this same story in a different context in Luke 15, essentially, there's a big party in heaven when a sheep is returned to the fold. The faithfulness of the majority should never cause us to neglect the weak and wandering. Now, just one more paragraph in this text. <clears throat> Jesus covers the steps necessary to restore someone who sins. This passage forms the basis of a section of our bylaws that speaks to the issue of someone who persists in sin and the responsibility that we all have to go to that person and seek to restore them. I hope that this happens in, a, in a, an informal way, in ways that I may not even know about, and as pastor and, and as the elders who serve here, we carry the responsibility to carry this forward. It's always a little bit awkward to do this. In my experience, it's always a little bit awkward. I've had the responsibility on several occasions to do this. And sometimes my efforts have been received with um, humility and repentance, and sometimes not. And at least one occasion, uh, that resistance to repentance went on for years. And then, wonderfully, God did a, a wonderful work in that person's life. And when I saw them again after many years, the sweet fellowship that we had before was restored because repentance had come into their lives. Let's look at the verses together, 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. 
Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. You may not have realized that those last verses were in this context. And context here is very important. What's Jesus saying? If someone is sinning, a fellow believer, and the way Jesus expressed it is sinning against you. Well, if another believer is sinning, it's against me because it violates the relationship that we have in Christ. It comes between us, whether they are sinning in offense against me personally or just caught up in some sin. The offense involves me. That's what Jesus is saying. And the simple process is this. Go alone and point out the sin. If she or he repents, the matter is settled. It doesn't have to go any farther. That's it. You realize that you stepped out of bounds here and this was obviously in violation of God's word and the re response you get is, you know, you're right. I was wrong when I did that. Would you pray with me? I, I don't want to live in this trap. The matter is over right there. If there's no repentance, Jesus said, go again and, and take one or two others with you as witnesses. If she or he repents, the matter is settled. So you don't have to call me. You could, but you don't have to call me or one of the elders. Just take one or two other believers with you. Go to this person. Now, this is an amazing thing because what usually happens? What usually happens is, did, did you, did, you know, I, you should know about this. You know that so-and-so, so, yeah, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw them. Or they, they said, somebody told me... You see how this stops all of that gossip? However, if after two or three speak to them, there's no repentance, share it with others in the wider context of the church. This is even more difficult. The process doesn't get easier. It gets more difficult. But the sharing is not so that you just have information to talk about. The sharing is for the purpose of, tasking them to also confront the sinning person, encouraging him or her to repent. That's the purpose of telling other people. That's the purpose of engaging others, to work together as a body to pull this person away from their sinful behavior. If they repent, the matter's over. If after time there is still no repentance, then Jesus said, again, I said this gets harder, not easier. Treat the person as if a non-believer. You have the assurance that God approves and empowers the process with the purpose to eventually bring the person to repentance. That's what this context speaks into, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus is saying, when you follow this process, you have heaven's approval of the process. I'm right there with you. Now, what does it mean to treat someone as a non-believer? Well, obviously, if someone's been teaching Sunday school, they can't teach Sunday school anymore. If someone is serving in a church office, they need to be removed from that office until they repent. Does it mean they can't come to church? No, they can come to church, of course. But it means that there are certain privileges and ministries that they cannot share in until they repent. Is sin a serious business? Yes. How serious? Jesus said, if it, something is causing you to sin... Cut that out of your life. Now, this process has the added benefit of preventing bitterness to take root, especially if this sin has been specifically against you. Because, again, the temptation is to turn that anger in on yourself, the anger that you feel when you feel like someone has wronged you, turn that in on yourself and let it simmer and cook on the back burner of your emotions until it starts getting really rancid and bitterness begins to develop. This process prevents bitterness. Now, I'm responsible for this. The elders are responsible. All of us as believers are responsible for this. Even if you have a believer who's not a part of this church, maybe he's part of another church, but he's your friend, you know this person or you know her, and she's caught in sin, we all bear this responsibility, Jesus said. This is how life in the kingdom of God is supposed to work. It's just this practical. 
Now, this discussion prompted Peter to raise questions about forgiveness. And in some of the most interesting and amazing verses of Scripture we're going to look at next week, the second half of this message from Matthew 18. And I think there's a verse in this coming passage for next week that is one of the most remarkable and insightful verses in in all of the Gospel of Matthew. I, I look forward to sharing it together with you next week. Meanwhile, as we finish this morning, let me just uh, share this quotation from you, from with you from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, from his book Life Together. Very insightful. Let me read this to you. Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him, and the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous it is in his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. And I have this saying, that which I keep secret is that which controls me. Sin shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. This can happen even in the midst of a pious community. Even in the midst of that, someone can be holding on to a private sin. Nobody knows it, but what's happening to that person is that they are slowly decaying on the inside. In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and seclusion of the heart. The sin must be brought into the light. The unexpressed must be openly spoken and acknowledged. All that is secret and hidden made manifest. It's a hard struggle until the sin is openly admitted, but God breaks gates of brass and bars of iron. Since the confession of sin is made in the presence of a Christian brother or sister, the last stronghold of self-justification is abandoned. The sinner surrenders. He gives up all of his evil. He gives his heart to God and he finds the forgiveness of all his sin in the fellowship of Jesus Christ and his brother or sister. The expressed, acknowledged sin has lost all of its power. It has been revealed and judged as sin. It can no longer tear the fellowship asunder. Now the fellowship bears the sin of the brother. He's no longer alone with his evil, for he's cast off his sin from him. Now he stands in the fellowship of sinners who live by the grace of God and the cross of Christ. The sin concealed separated him from the fellowship, made all his apparent fellowship a sham. The sin confessed has helped him define true fellowship with his brothers in Christ Jesus. This is the beauty of this process. Jesus is sharing with us the secrets of how life in the body of Christ is designed by him to work. And we, be, we frankly need to be more faithful in carrying out this process personally and perhaps even so as a church. We have been given clear instruction from God's word. Let's be faithful in living it. Father, we thank you for these plain principles of your word. We've received them this morning. Our hearts have been opened to these truths. Now as we embrace them, may we faithfully live them. May sin continue to be eradicated from our personal lives and from our corporate experience. May we have the courage to faithfully obey as you've instructed us, starting with our own vigilance against temptation and then our loving care for one another. May humility and meekness be the foundation upon which we proceed. Because indeed, Lord, we want to be great in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
service. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. Cause nothing else could take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are dear Draw me close to you, draw me close to you, never let me go, I lay it all down again, to hear you say that I'm your friend, you are my desire. You are my desire, no one else will do, cause nothing else could take your place, to feel the warmth of your embrace, help me find the way, bring me back to you. You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are near You're all I want You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are near Help me know you are near Oh, 
sheep. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. thousand reasons or bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Let's go. 
So, Father, I pray that in our relationships this week, our interaction, our communication, that wouldn't be about us, Father, but be bringing praise and glory to your name. We worship you. Thank you so much. You're dismissed. Thank you for being here with us this morning.